Well, if you have your Bible this morning, go ahead and turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 16. 2 Samuel chapter 16. It's good to be back this morning. I want to thank all of you for uh, your prayers for, for me and for, for Kelly. And uh, we're, we're grateful for you praying for us. And uh, these uh, have been some challenging days the last couple of weeks. And even um, leading into this, I, I feel like... Um, in fact, Bob and I were talking about this. I mean, it... it it was, um, you know what, I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> Second Samuel chapter 16 this morning. It's good to be back. It's good to be back. And, you know, we can talk sick stuff later on. Let's just, let's just go to the Word. Second Samuel 16. Well, let, let me do this. Let me give you just a, a little, because we hadn't been here in a couple weeks. And so, uh, well, some of you have, but... but um, um, just as a reminder, we're right in the middle of Absalom's rebellion. And uh, we, we highlighted this last time that David actually takes the exact route that the Lord Jesus would take um, as he uh, leaves uh, Jerusalem and goes to uh, um, across the Kidron, Brook Kidron, and to the Mount of Olives uh, where he is arrested. Uh, David takes that same route. Uh, we've highlighted this over and over that David uh, is a type of Christ. Uh, we see um, pictures of, of Christ in David. Um, that said, uh, David was also a, um, and this is the contrast, he's a sinner. Uh, like us, he's in need of grace. And so, uh, there's a great contrast between Christ and um, David in that sense. Uh, David, as we have noted, uh, is the middle of Absalom's rebellion. Uh, he didn't see it coming. Uh, he's fleeing with his household. He's on the run, and as he's running, trying to get away, um, he encounters uh, various people on the on the way. We looked at chapter 15 last time, and and there are three folks that he encountered. And then in this chapter, there are three folks that he's going to encounter. Something we need to say about David before we get into this is uh, uh, David, like us, uh, is a sinner uh, that needs the grace of God. But David is not like us in another way. And this is what I want to emphasize is that David is not just an ordinary man. Uh, he is anointed by God. God has chosen him as his anointed one, his instrument. And I, I think that's really important for us to understand that, that we've highlighted that David is, um, as king, uh, he's co-regent, reigning with God, but as king, he represents uh, the Lord on the earth. He represents the Lord to Israel. And I bring that out because to rebel against David as king is to rebel against the Lord and his kingdom. So when we think about Absalom's rebellion, it's not simply family rebellion. It's not just that he's going against his father. No, he, it is divine treason. He, he is rebelling against the Lord. And we need to keep that in mind as we read through this. And so we would understand that David is the anointed of God. There's a tension that's taking place in this passage of Scripture. I don't know that I can articulate it that well. But the tension is, is, that, is that David is God's anointed. He's his chosen one. And as such, he's under protection of the Lord. But the tension is this, is that because David, as Yahweh's representative, as, as the, the Lord's representative, David has sinned. And as, as a sinner, and we noted this, his sin against uh, Bathsheba and Uriah, that because of his sin, he's also under the divine judgment of God. So you had this tension. You've got David 
who's protected. He's the anointed one of the Lord. And yet David is also under the chastisement, under the judgment of the Lord as well. And we see that tension in this passage of Scripture. Well, let's read it in its entirety. There's 23 verses here, beginning in verse number 1. Now, when David had passed a little beyond the summit, behold, Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, met him with a couple of saddled donkeys. And on them were 200 loaves of bread, 100 clusters of raisins, 100 summer fruits, and a jug of wine. And the king said to Ziba, why do you have these? And Ziba said, the donkeys are for the king's household to ride, and the bread and summer fruit for the young men to eat, and the wine for whoever is faint in the wilderness to drink. Then the king said, and where is your master's son? And Ziba said to the king, behold, he is staying in Jerusalem, for he said, today the house of Israel will restore the kingdom of my father to me. So the king said to Ziba, Behold, all that belongs to Mephibosheth is yours. And Ziba said, I prostrate myself. Let me find favor in your sight, O Lord, O my Lord the king. And when King David came to Behurium, behold, there, was, there came out from there a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei the son of Gera. He came out cursing continually as he came. He, he threw stones at David and at all the servants of King David and all the people and all the mighty men were at the right hand and his left. And Shimei said when he cursed, get out, get out, you man of bloodshed and worthless fellow. The Lord has returned to you all the bloodshed of the house of Saul in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. And behold, you are taken in your own evil, for you are a man of bloodshed. Then Abishai, the son of Zariah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over now and cut off his head. But the king said, what I, what I have to do with you, O sons of Zariah? If he curses, and if the Lord has told him, curse David, then who shall say, why have you done so? Then David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my son, who came out from me, seeks my life. How much more now this Benjamite? Let him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him. Perhaps the Lord will look on my affliction and return good to me instead of his cursing this day. So David and his men went on the way, and Shimei went along on the hillside parallel with him, and he went and he cursed and he cast stones and threw dust at him. The king and all the people who were with him arrived weary, and he refreshed himself there. Then Absalom and all the people, the men of Israel, entered Jerusalem, and Ahithophel with him. Now it came about when Hushai, the archite, David's friend, came to Absalom, that Hushai said to Absalom, long live the king, long live the king. And Absalom said to Hushai, is this your loyalty to your friend? Why did you not go with your friend? And Hushai said to Absalom, no. For whom the Lord, this people, and all the men of Israel have chosen, his I will be, and with him I will remain. Besides, whom should I serve? Should I not serve in the presence of his son? As I have served your father's presence, so I will be in your presence. Then Absalom said to Ahithophel, Give your advice, what shall we do? And Ahithophel said to Absalom, Go into your father's concubines, whom he has left to keep the house. Then all Israel will hear that you have made yourself odious to your father. The hands of all who are with you will also be strengthened. 
So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof, and Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. And the advice of Ahithophel, which he gave in those days, was if one inquired of the word of God, so was all the advice of Ahithophel regarded by both David and Absalom. And this is the word of our Lord. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, as we hear your word this morning, we ask that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would soften our hearts that we might delight in your presence, that you would sharpen our minds that we may discern and know your truth. Lord, we ask that you would shape our wills that we may desire your ways. This we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, David, as he's leaving, fleeing away from Absalom and this rebellion, encounters three different people in this passage of Scripture, three enemies of God, if you will. And what I'd like to do as we walk through this is really just kind of highlight um, what we can see, some, some lessons that we can learn from uh, this particular passage as David encounters these three enemies. And the first one I would have you to note is in verses 1 through 4, where he encounters Ziba. Now, it may be strange that we would consider Ziba to be an enemy because on the surface, it looks like uh, Ziba is someone who is a friend, who is loyal. In fact, Ziba uh, comes to David, and as he comes to him, he has uh, all of this, uh, um, these saddled donkeys. He has all these uh, loaves of bread, uh, choice raisins, uh, a hundred summer fruits, and a jug of wine. And here is uh, David encountering Ziba. This is not the first time that we've seen Ziba before. You recall that Ziba, we were introduced to him earlier when we were introduced to Mephibosheth. And you recall that Mephibosheth was the one that was uh, the grandson of, of Saul who was crippled, uh, the son of uh, Jonathan. And Ziba is the one who is serving um, Mephibosheth. Now, I've already read ahead a little bit, and I hope that you have read ahead as well. But if you've done so, you know that Ziba is actually lying at this moment. In fact, in chapter 19, when we read the rest of the story, we find out that Mephibosheth, that this is not, this, the circumstances that are being described by Ziba are not a reality. He's being deceptive. Ziba is playing the fence, so to speak. He's hedging his bets. He, he wants to make sure as the, king is, as the king is leaving Jerusalem, just in case the king comes back, uh, he decides that he's going to help out the king. And so he has all of these uh, materials ready for him. And the king asks, and it seems somewhat of a question in verse number two, he wants to know, why do you have these things? And he tells him why, that this is for your household. Uh, this is uh, uh, for you on your travel, so to speak. And then the king asks the question in verse number three, and where is your master's son? Master's son is a reference to Saul. Where is Saul's son? He's from the household of Saul. He's a Benjamite. And he asked a question. And notice how Ziba responds. He says he's staying in Jerusalem. For he said, today the house of Israel will restore the kingdom of my father to me. Now, what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is, as we'll see, Mephibosheth really didn't say that. But Ziba is taking advantage of this opportunity. He knows that David is in a tough spot, and because he's in this tough spot, 
he takes advantage of the situation, and what he tries to do is exploit David. And David responds in verse number 4 by saying that all that belongs to Mephibosheth is yours. In other words, David believes what Ziba has said. Now, we can criticize David for the way that he handled this situation. Because, after all, David should have known better about Mephibosheth. His history with Mephibosheth, he should have known that, that this was not the case. But before we get too critical of David, we need to be aware of the situation. David's been surprised. I can't even imagine what it was like to have your child turn on you, to have Israel turn on you, uh, to be responsible for a, a household and on the move. I, I can't even imagine what that would be like. But as David is trying to, to get away, he's in a very vulnerable place. You know, the Scripture makes it clear about um, how we're to take someone in terms of uh, a testimony, a witness, that it's established on the witness of two or three. David doesn't have that here. But again, before we're too critical with him, uh, we should be aware that David is in a vulnerable spot. He's not acting like himself here. And sometimes trials will do that to us. It'll put us in situations where we don't respond in the normal way that we would respond. But there's something else that we, if we don't highlight it, we will miss it. And that is, as you see this deceptive act on Ziba's part, and you see a foolish act on David's part, you also see the grace of the Lord in providing for David and his household in the midst of this. It's really quite amazing to think that God uses this deceptive Ziba uh, to be able to provide for David. I've seen this on occasion that uh, sometimes the, by the grace of God, we, we see the most unlikely people that God would use to provide for his people. And so don't miss that in this, that yes, uh, Ziba, he exploited the situation, uh, his motives are wrong, he's going to be discovered later on, but God uses even that wicked act to provide for his people. This is a big God we serve. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, our God is sovereign, and, and our God is able to provide. I mean, it, it just amazes me how he can provide in these kind of situations. Well, you see, secondly, beginning in verse number five, that David comes across another fellow. This, this actually, this uh, Shimei, this would be a hilarious story if it were not true. Because you get the picture here that this Shimei, he's as, as David, I mean, I mean you got to think about this. David and his band as they're leaving Jerusalem, I mean, it's got to be a low, low point. And then Shimei comes, and while they are going along, Shimei is there throwing stones at David and the people. He's just going along with them, throwing stones at them. I know the sticks and stones certainly come to mind when I read that passage of Scripture. But David, as he's leaving, Shimei comes and he curses him. Shimei takes up, um, he, he has, he's from the household of Saul and he has a, a, a major problem with David. And, and, and I would say as you look at this, it's, uh, we, we, perhaps you've encountered this before, that sometimes uh, opportunities create situations where we learn about the character of people. In other words, with Shimei here, 
had this opportunity or had this uh, occasion not happen, we might not have learned the hatred that he had for David. It's almost like he's just waiting on this moment. Just waiting on this moment, waiting for something to go wrong. Coworker, family member. I mean, they're just, they're just waiting for an opportunity for you to slip up, for you to, to fall, or for to you be in, in, a, in a weak spot or in a trial so that they can come along beside you and say, where's your God at now? Shimei comes against David in verse number 7. It's interesting the words that he uses. He says, get out, get out, you man of bloodshed. He basically calls him a, a murderer, a, a worthless fellow. Here's the problem. He is. David is a murderer. David knows this. I'm not sure that Shimei knows this. Shimei brings his accusations against him. In verse number 8, he tells him that the Lord has returned upon you all the bloodshed of the house of Saul, which is a lie, in whose place you have reigned. Now, God had anointed David. David was to replace Saul, but it was the Lord who did that. It wasn't David who was taking matters in his own hand. In fact, quite the opposite. But he's accusing him, and the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. That's a lie. He didn't give the kingdom to Absalom. Absalom took it. But he wouldn't be able to secure it, and he wouldn't be able to hold on to it. And behold, you are taken in your own evil, for you are a man of bloodshed. So he, he comes against him, and he calls him a murderer. And notice how Abishai, the son of Zariah, responds to this. Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over now and cut off his head. You always got that one in the crowd. I'll shut him up. I mean, he's, he's cursing and he's carrying on. Cut his head off, that'll stop. <laughs> this is how some people want to resolve things. And by the way, I find this quite amazing when I look at King David, that David could have said, take him out. I think of those mafia movies, you know. I mean, that, that's, I mean, David, David showed such calmness, such humility. He, he could have easily have told him, just go and silence them. He's the king. Yes, Absalom is, is, is trying to take the throne, but David is the king, and they know he's the king. Just, just because we have the opportunity doesn't mean that we should step or take that opportunity. And David didn't do that. He had the power. He had the authority. I, I think those probably who were getting hit by some of the rocks, they probably would have welcomed David to go ahead and send this man over there and shut him up. I could see that. But notice how David responds, and this is a, a lesson for us in how he responds, the humility in which he responds to the criticism that comes against him. And first of all, he calls in verse number 11, He says, uh, Behold, my son who came out from me seeks my life. How much more this Benjamite? Let him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him. Now, that's strange. Because David's response is that, you know, if Absalom is, is my own son is trying to seek my life, how much more would this Benjamite, this person from the house of Saul, would he try to seek my life? 
But in humility, David responds by a saying, let him alone and let him curse for the Lord has told him. So, so David actually was guilty of something worse. We've, I've already said that. But we should not think that what David is saying here, he's not saying that God specifically had assigned uh, Shimei uh, to uh, come and, and curse him. I, I don't think that that's what he's saying. He's not saying that he specifically has this role that God told me to go and do this. That's not what he's saying. But rather what David saw is that this, that this humiliation that he's experiencing from Shimei is a result of God's sovereign chastisement, his discipline. David knew he was under the hand of God's judgment. And, and David's response in humility was perhaps, perhaps, this is how God is judging me and disciplining me. All this had to do, obviously, with the sin of Bathsheba and Uriah. But then, secondly, I want you to notice in verse number 12, because this is where it gets really interesting, because his response is perhaps... Perhaps the Lord will look on my affliction and return good to me instead of his cursing this day. Now, this is an interesting phrase here. In most English translations, if you're reading it, it says, perhaps the Lord will look on my affliction. And I want to highlight that word affliction. Because there is a, a, a problem in the text. There's a textual problem there concerning the word affliction in verse number 12. That word affliction could be translated iniquity. Again, most translations, English translations, have this word as affliction, and it seems to fit well. Perhaps the Lord will look on my affliction and return good to me instead of his cursing this day. The word that is used for affliction or that could be translated iniquity are really close, and there are some variances where it is translated iniquity. But that's strange, isn't it? I mean, that doesn't really fit well when you think about iniquity. Perhaps the Lord will look on my affliction and return good to me instead of his cursing this day. But how does it fit with affliction? Or how does it fit with iniquity? And I would suggest that I really think that probably is a better translation that it is iniquity. Let me put it this way. If you're writing out, translating that verse of Scripture, and you're passing it along and you're just writing it out, I would think writing affliction would be easy. But I could see somebody struggling over writing iniquity. David, David is saying, perhaps the Lord will look on my iniquity and return good to me instead of his cursing this day. Perhaps the Lord would look on my iniquity. Perhaps he would look upon my sin and repay with goodness and grace. Does that sound like the gospel? Doesn't that sound like the Lord Jesus Christ? That out of cursing comes blessing? What I think what David is, is emphasizing here is that perhaps the Lord will look on my iniquity. He, he recognizes that he's sinned. He recognizes that he's murdered Uriah. He sinned with Bathsheba. He's confessed that. But maybe, maybe if I will humble myself, 
Maybe if I humble myself before the Lord, maybe God will have mercy upon me. Because the posture needs to be that of a contrite heart. It needs to be that of humility. In other words, what David is doing is, is he, he recognizes, he acknowledges what he deserves, but, but he puts himself in a, in a position of humility. Perhaps God would be gracious to me and show me grace and humility. I'm reminded of 1 Peter 5, 6. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time he may exalt you. God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. David has this view of God that I hope that we have. That God is gracious and that he's ready and that he's quick to forgive, that he desires to forgive. He loves to forgive. And he loves to show his grace. So in the midst of criticism, when somebody comes against you, rather than let your friends or loved ones take them out, so to speak, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and appeal to his mercy and his grace. So David and his men go on his way. Verse 14 says that they're arrived weary and he refreshed himself there. I got to think they were exhausted. If you've been the object of someone's harsh criticism and accusations, you know that that can be exhausting. But the story turns a little towards Absalom there in verses 15 through 23. And it introduces us again to that Ahithophel, who we will see more and more as we walk through this next couple of weeks. But he was an advisor, you remember, to David. Some commentators look at Ahithophel and his betrayal of David much like that of Judas. He was a a loyal advisor, and yet he sides with Absalom. But David has, you recall that last time we were together a few weeks ago, that David had prayed about the counsel of Ahithophel, that it would be confused, and, and God sent a man who we see in verse number 16, the archite, Hushai, David's friend. Remember that we looked at this, that David is going back to be with Absalom there? Now, this is a loyal friend of David, and Absalom knows it. And when Absalom sees him, he says to Absalom in verse 16, Long live the king, long live the king. By the way, I'll just highlight this as we walk through this. Absalom when he hears everything that this man, the archite, says, Absalom interprets it as he's talking about himself, Absalom. But if you read it, it's very clear that his loyalty is to David. His words are in such a way that he's not, when he says long live the king, he's not talking about Absalom, he's talking about David. But Absalom... And you've encountered some folks like this that they think that everything is about themselves. And Absalom is self-centered, and he's thinking that this is a loyal, this man who was loyal to my father is now being loyal to me. Look at verse 18. For whom the Lord, this people, and all the men of Israel have chosen, his I will be, and with him I will remain. Who's he talking about? Absalom hears that he's talking about him, but I think on the surface it's very clear because his loyalty is to David. He's talking about David. 
and, 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 and let me say this, because because when you look at this, what he's going to do, this archite, is he, he's, he's going to set himself up, he's going to deceive Absalom, and he's going to set himself up as an advisor to Absalom. And some people would say, well, uh, that's not a good thing because he's being deceptive. And so you should not deceive or lie. But listen, this is war. And his loyalty is to King David. And let me say this for the record, that those who come against God's people, that there are times where we should be deceptive. There are times where, where we, we should be loyal to the king. Well, we should always be loyal to the king. I'll give you an example. You'll recall that when the midwives, when they lied to Pharaoh about the children, they deceived him. See the same thing with Rahab, that she deceived those who would come and try to arrest her looking for the men, the spies who were hiding out. In other words, there is a deception that takes place, and, and I have no issue with this, that this is war, and because it's war, and because his allegiance is to the Lord's anointed, I have no problem with him being deceptive towards Absalom. If the government came into my house and they were coming against the people of God, I would have no problem at all being deceptive. Y'all doing all right? Why? Because they are against God's people. They're against the, they're against the anointed of God. If you don't think this is war, then you are badly mistaken. And war is just beginning. Notice his counsel. And this is so wicked. His counsel to Ahithophel, his counsel to Absalom, upon asking for advice is to go into your father's concubine whom he has left to keep the house. Remember that David had left 10 concubines behind to keep the house and the advice is for the son to go into his father's concubine. That's wicked. But what he was doing was he was making Israel choose. He was drawing a line in the sand and saying, either you are for David or you're for Absalom. He was making it very clear. He was, there was no returning, no coming back from this. Verse 22 says that they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof. And Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. We should not take that to be literally, but we should take that to understand that all Israel knew what was taking place on the roof at that time. And then it ends with this in verse 23. We highlighted this before, the advice of Ahithophel, which he gave in those days was if one inquired of the word of God, so was the advice of Ahithophel regarded by both David and Absalom. There's a little bit of irony in that. In other words, what, what the advice of Ahithophel was such that they took it as if it was the word of God, that both Absalom and David took this as this, this is how we should respond, this is what we should do. But what's interesting in the irony is, is the advice, the counsel that he gave 
actually ended up being the fulfillment of the Word of God. Turn to chapter 12, and I'm going to close here. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 11 and 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 11 and 12. This is David being confronted. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion. And he will lie with your wives in broad daylight. This is what God told David was going to happen because of his sin. Indeed, you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and under the sun. So what David did in secret, what David did in private, God brought to the public. You know, we don't know, when you look at David's sin, we don't know, had David responded quicker? Had David repented earlier? We don't know how much grace that David would have received. But one thing is for sure, that David's sin did find him out. And one thing is for sure, that, that what we do in private and secret, God will one day expose publicly. And if that doesn't cause you to want to repent and turn away from your sin, then you don't understand that statement. One day, God will bring to the surface. He will bring to the light all that is hidden. So now, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of grace and forgiveness. Today is the day of repentance. Run, run to Christ. Confess your sin. Turn away from your sin. Run. Run while he may be found. Some weeks ago, I talked a little bit about John Newton, and I don't know that I told the rest of the story, but in, I was reading a letter by Newton, and he was talking about our sin. And the question is, is on the day of judgment, will our sin be revealed? Now, the short answer, and I gave this last time, was we don't know. <laughs> we don't know exactly. But, but here, here's what we do know. What we do know is that when it comes to our sin, that we are justified in Christ Jesus. We are forgiven by Christ Jesus. So if we confess our sins... If we repent, we turn away from our sins, we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. We know that we can be forgiven. And in terms of justification, that is that we have been declared righteous, we know this, that our sin is far from the east to the west, that God will remember our sin no more in terms of justification. But here's where Newton goes a little further. What about the sin after that? It's forgiven, but will we give an account for it? And the question remains, on that day when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, is he going to reveal all those things that are hidden, all those things that are secret? We're not told exactly. But if he does, we know this. It will be for his glory 
Because when all that is revealed, what also was revealed is that he has satisfied the payment for our sin. But until that day, keep a short list on your sin. As quick as you sin, be quick to repent and turn to the Lord for grace and forgiveness. Trust in Christ and Christ alone for forgiveness. And go and sin no more. Will you stand with me for prayer? Father, as we contemplate the, the truths that are in this passage of Scripture, we pray, Lord, that you might look upon our iniquity and that you might repay us with grace and forgiveness. Lord, we thank you for the hope and the promise that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And may we live our lives in light of the day that we will stand before him and give an account. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.